This is the BBC Home Service from the Midlands. With the cooperation of the Polio Research Fund, we present The Body Blow. I remember giving my name and then this awful suffocation feeling, couldn't breathe. The next time I woke up, I heard this machine sort of shh. I heard the word polio, but I didn't exactly connect it with myself. I think that it's just a word you read in the papers and you say, oh, that's that awful thing those people in Kent got, you know, isn't it a shame? The Body Blow, a radio ballad by Ewan McCall, Peggy Seeger and Charles Parker on the battle with poliomyelitis fought by five people, by Norma Smith. I got polio in 1958 and um, I'm now left paralysed below the waist, no use in my legs at all. By Heather Ruffell. Well, I'm left virtually without any movement except my head. Breathing is difficult. I use my neck muscles a lot, particularly when I'm lying down. But sitting up, I have to frog breathe. That's why I sound a bit disjointed. By Paul Bates. The most upsetting thing about having your tracheotomy down or your throat cut is that you lose the basic form of communication you cannot speak and that is the most upsetting thing but for some reason I could speak and I still can uh, quite independently of when the machine's going up or down whereas other tracheotomies like Dutchy for instance they can only speak on the inspiration phase of the machine by Dutchy Holland to whose machine chopped speech the tape recorder with the editing that it makes possible can restore wholeness we can still do many things that we used to do in the old days. So please don't pity us. And worst of all, don't look at a crippled person and think they're mental. Because believe me, they're not. And the battle fought back in the everyday world of the housewife by Jean Hager. And of course, there's always embarrassing moments in your life when you're disabled not only in finding new ways in dressing yourself and but you do come up against people the battle of five people against polio we present the body blow What day did the world stop moving? What day did the earth stop turning? What day did the sun stop shining? What day? On the Thursday I was in one world. On the Monday and Tuesday I seemed to have been thrown into a completely different world. <laughs> It was in the season of the year when the small birds they do fly. When the flowers are blooming fresh and gay and the sun burns in the sky. I spied a fair young woman by the margin of the sea. A taking of the pleasant air with her young babe but her knee All through that summer's afternoon how they did sport and play Till tired at last upon the sand that fair young woman lay She heard the cries of wheeling gulls and the murmur of the sea but she did not hear the coming of the hidden enemy. All oh, drunk and drowsy with the sun, she lay there half in sleep. While undetected to her side, the enemy did creep. Death did stand at her right hand and did no mercy show. But to this young woman cruelly 
dealt a body blow. I went down to Brighton with my daughter for about three or four days, you know, having the usual nice time, taking on the swings and going on the beach. And I came home to tea and I had this awful sensation around my waist. I couldn't stand the material of my blouse on my waist and all my legs were aching. I went to bed early, took a couple of aspirins, and Carol was sleeping with me because we were a bit squashed for a room. And... I couldn't stand the touch of her, you know, her legs on my body in bed. I felt most peculiar sensations. I was in an awful lot of pain and had a very bad night. I had the doctor on the Sunday morning and he said it was flu. And so, of course, everybody thought it was flu. So I came downstairs, so not to be a nuisance, you know, with trays and things, and I, I fell, fell on the floor. I was very surprised, you know. I mean, I'd had flu before, but I'd never exactly been so weak as to fall down so, of course, I came and laid on the couch all the Sunday. I felt terribly ill. And Sunday night, I don't think I could have been conscious, really. Blow by blow, this cruel foe does strike with grim intent. Until the body is laid low, all strength and courage spent. The citadel is occupied, the road from brain to hand is blocked now by the enemy and death is in command. I was sort of shivering, terribly cold and this terrible headache, it felt as if I had my head split open. Bang, 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 like someone inside with drums. Terrific pains up each side of my neck, felt as if it was hanging half on the top. And he said, I think you've got a touch of rheumatics in the head. Your neck muscles go and you walk around like some old man. I wondered whatever was happening to me. My arms and legs started to go and then finally my breathing and when I was rushed to hospital I wondered what on earth was going on. It is sort of dreamlike when you've had a shock to the body and of course then your mind there's a shock to the mind as well and of course you don't see anybody's face I mean they haven't got any sort of identity to you just eyes, that makes it more weird. They're masked because you're so infectious. You just see eyes, different sorts of eyes peering at you. Wearing white gowns and white masks, frightened eyes looking at me. I got up to make my husband a cup of tea. Sit up. Your brain will say, Sit up, for suddenly nothing happens. You think, but I didn't sit up. I'm losing the use of my left arm. He said, go on, you're havering. I said, I'm not. What's the matter? I'm losing the use of it. I could feel the use going out of the shoulder, right down to the fingertips. And he, I can always remember him lifting my arm and turning it round and round and round to try to put the life into it again. I think, gosh, my legs are gone. I can't move my arms. When you get such a shock. It felt, to me, it felt like all the muscles were being actually knocked out of action. It was like electric light bulbs all burning out. One, two, three, four. Just one after the other. Yes. It's a strange thing about nature that you just don't realise how serious a thing is at the time. It's almost nature's way of protecting you. The hidden foe, it lies in wait and chooses place and time. It strikes the woman in her bloom, the young man in his prime. The runner who is in full stride, the soldier in the field, 
The strong, the young, the healthy to this enemy must yield. Do you recall how you climbed the mountains? In the morning swim in the salt sea water. What was the name of the powerful sprinter? Was it you? Ten thousand miles across the world, far from his native land. The young man leads his company, a carbine in his hand. By swamp and jungle path he goes and stalks his human foe. But the hidden enemy behind him deals a body blow. 1954, August 1954 serving in Malaya, doing what I think would have been one of my last patrols. I got up and my men carried all my equipment except the carbine. I had no thoughts of what might be wrong with me, I just felt ill. They got me into an Ulster to fly down to Kuala Lumpur, down to the base hospital. And I'm rather big, six feet four which doesn't, you know, go east into that sort of thing. It dragged me out feet first. I got into the ward, was helped to undress, and I sat on the edge of the bed, and then decided to, to lie down, be more comfortable, lay back, and I couldn't get my left leg onto the bed. And that was the last time that I sat on the side of a bed or, or anywhere. <laughs> And from then on, things really began to move. I was transferred to a tank respirator. And I had the bulb of earlier, which means the paralysis of the swallowing. It's quite simple invention. You drown. You see, in your excretions, you can't cope with them. And they, the idea is that you put a tube down the person's throat, feed air through the tube, and then you can take them out of the iron lung, anaesthetize them, and then cut their throats, literally. Put a shortened tube straight into the throat, which I've still got eight years later, and breathe them through that, respire them through it. The unfortunate bear is still fighting, and they put this tube down my throat, and I bit through it. Um, I also bit the Aneath Desley, he tried to retrieve the, the broken tube. He tells quite an amusing story. I believe his leg, which is marvelous, He's a good, strong, strong Yorkshireman. I've met him since, and we're extremely good friends, and he always sort of licks his thumb when he comes in. But anyway, they did the operation in what I think they would claim to be a world record of about 28 seconds. And no anesthetics were necessary, because I was out and almost gone anyway. Every cell is spoiled and raided Every muscle is invaded Every nerve affected Brain from body disconnected Lungs are the next objective Can't breathe Can't breathe can't the mayor. The swimmer panics in the undertow. Fingers lose their hold on the rock face. The runner stumbles on the rim 
of darkness I think you've got to be a polio to really understand. We have a saying in this ward that we live dangerously. And by golly, you do. If someone's forgotten to put a shilling in a meter, bang goes your air supply. Mm. We have to have machines to help us live, but they're not enemies or awful, frightening things. The machines are our friends. Well, they're our life, our breath. Steel and plastic deputy for lungs. Does your breathing for you night and day? This small machine, your shield, your sword and buckler, holds death at bay. A week. A month, a century of pain. One day you may learn to breathe again. If not, you're joined for life. There's breathing to and you. Machine. Well, the first week in hospital, I didn't remember anything at all. Somebody. Not in this world at all. Calling my name. And I'm awfully sorry, but I really don't know you. Asking me what day it was. I remember there was a window, and I saw this funny shape. Easter Sunday. And I kept looking at it and wondering what it was. But I wasn't afraid. It was rather like Punch and Judy. And then it sort of materialised into a little nurse. And then, of course, as soon as she saw me, she smiled. And when I woke up at night, my husband was standing beside me. You know, people are awfully good. The way they talk to you and the way they help you. I used to wonder what was down below. I could hear people laughing. I suppose there are other patients in the other wards and I could hear television. But a lot of those sounds used to make me feel ill because it, I had an awful sensation if anybody shouted or that somebody dropped something, it used to go through my body like a pain. As if I was super sensitive, my whole body, all my skin used to creep with this noise. You're ill. The whole body is aching. It's not used to being lying on its back and flat. And the muscles are gradually changing because they're not being used. You get passive movements, but those are agony. Of course, you're very surprised because I've always thought that paralysed people were numb. You know, I always thought if anybody was paralysed, they wouldn't feel anything. And of course, you do feel everything. Body's aching and it's racked with pain. It certainly is in the beginning. It's a deep bone ache. It's in every muscle and everything. Your whole body seems to shriek with pain. And your heels little pains start and then they get like flames and then they get like worse flames and unless somebody lifts them and rubs them to relieve that uh, it just gets well it just nearly blots you out you just have to give into it you just have to lie there and bear it you see you can't do anything about it you just have to let yourself get carried away on the pain to me I kept feeling it's just like being crucified all the time you have to know pain to appreciate being out of pain. That's why the pain when I first got polio and the no pain now, that's why I'm happy. To me at that time, I felt that 
the world was finished for me. And it was a silly feeling. I knew it was silly. I kept saying all day long, I want to get out of here. I must get out. I'm going. I'm going to get out. And the fact that I knew my mind told me I couldn't get out made it worse. I felt more desperate to get out then. I wanted to walk away from the situation, I think. I just thought I must get away from it. I didn't like it. I, I, I couldn't bear it. You see, you're just there as an individual, absolutely helpless. Only you can think. You've got a mind left. I often think back. I worked at Ford's on the commercial assembly line. Useless. Cling on to it desperately. I worked at Ford's. You're not master of your body. I would. If I was a dog, they'd have destroyed me. I would. I didn't want anybody to come near me. Ever again. The worst month was being isolated because then you've got time to think. And I can't help but wonder what good I'll ever be. A disabled mother, not able to look after her child, not able to look after my husband, not able to do a thing ever again. Hands that were supple and strong The best servants that ever could be Weak and crippled now Why should this happen to me? You're just not in control anymore. You're not the controller. Legs strong and shapely for walking and running and dancing too. Weak and crippled now, why should this happen to you? You resent your body because it won't do the things you want it to do. One just resents everything, I just resented living. What lies in store to shuffle on crutches? Will that fate be mine? To creep like an old man an inch at a time. To be pump fed with air. To be wheeled in a chair. To, to be, be rocked on a bed, bed like a babe in its cot. Will I stagnate and rot? I served all throughout the war and never received a scratch. But it makes me laugh to think that now I can't move nothing all these years later. Life is a turn of the head The vanquished body is helpless and waits to be fed The hands that obeyed you, the legs that conveyed you Just memories, now you're dependent on somebody else All the time people are doing things for you. I'm sure this is one of the hardest things all through. One is grateful, and yet one doesn't want to be grateful because one doesn't want to be so dependent. And that is so hard. You know, it's much easier to give than to receive. And my goodness, it's hard to receive all the time. I think at that point, if one just lies back and takes it, then one probably would pick out. I used to hate it. It's one of the very few things that I still get hopping mad about. You have to ask for every mortal thing. You know, 
resentful. I was a very nasty patient at first. I wasn't grateful for anything that was done for me. And I knew I wasn't being nice about it, and that made me feel worse, you know? And apart from that, you see, then you've got the indignity of all this. People cleaning your teeth as if they're doing a doorstep, you know? <laughs> Scrabbing away and your mouth stuck up with toothpaste, tons more than you'd use yourself. You feel that you could do a clumsy thing and you, you sort of clench your teeth and say, for goodness sake, it's not a doorstep you're scrubbing, it's my teeth. Come along, dear, you know, open up. Talk to us if you're a semi-idiot child. And this vigorous scrubbing on your teeth, you sort of dread it. One just laid there and demanded. You wanted your hand moved or your foot moved. And then to be told, wait a minute, I'm busy. You hate them for it. Can't they see that you want your hand moved? No one gets completely intolerant. I'm sure the concern was to, to get this physical disorders sorted out as best they could be, to get this lump that I'd been presented with, get it organized. If I wasn't going to move, well, we could get comfortable and get the insides to work properly. Everything becomes a major problem. It doesn't frighten you, the respirator, because I think you're so glad to not struggle for breath. And when this thing is put on you, or you're put into it, the relief, you stop struggling and this thing breathes for you and you feel calm. This will breathe for you. You're safe as a babe in a cradle of steel. You're waiting and hoping and praying your body will heal. But your mind fills with fear as the moment draws near to part from your friendly machine and try breathing alone. I wasn't afraid while I was in the lung at all, ever. But I was afraid to come out. I can always remember sister pulling me out a little bit every day, five minutes, ten minutes, extended periods. And then she said to me one morning, Mrs. Hacker, we're going to take you out to lung today and you're going to lie on the bed. I was quite happy with that. But when night came, I got a terrific fear. I wanted back in it. And in the morning, she said, well, you're still here, aren't you? So I said, yes, it looks like it. She, so she said, well, look, you're not going in the lung again. She said, and nothing will happen to you. I used to find myself looking at people. I was so frightened of forgetting walking. You see, I thought perhaps memory came into it. And if anybody stopped and turned to look at their nylon, see if their seams were straight, I could feel it as she was feeling. And I was thinking, yes, yeah, she'll have the weight on that leg now, as she turns around to look at the other leg with her leg back, you know, see if her seams were straight. But I remember myself doing that so many times. I just think that might help me. Try to remember walking, create the design. The sequence of movement And then keep it clear in your mind The coordination The exact relation Between toes and ankle The calf and the knee And the thigh When you're lying down there, you feel so much like a landed dab. You feel more like a moth on a pin down there. You don't feel equal to anyone. You see, you're lying so flat, terribly laid out. But, you know, I had this bell in between my fingers for the nurse, and I could press it. And then they started giving me sandwiches on my chest, and I had to get my arm up from here to get a little tiny, they're all tiny sandwiches, 
put it into my mouth. It was a great effort. It took me a long time, but it was nice to be able to feed myself. And of course, having the use of my arms helped me an awful lot to alleviate my discomfort. And I started on physiotherapy then. Terribly tiring. I mean, really, when you think of it, these physiotherapies, they're terribly strong. I mean, they really are pushing against you. I mean, it's like all in wrestling. She's got your arm going back and forth, and again, and again, and again, and again. I had a great big woman of about six foot, she had red hair, and she sat down for a rest. She said, oh, I'm exhausted. Goodness. You know, she's putting me through it. Up and down, up and down. I just, just like all in wrestling, you know, pushing and tugging and pulling. It's all good for you, but, oh, it's exhausting. A physiotherapist because you stops you from getting when you've been stiff you know you feel all your limbs loosening up and that does alleviate a lot of the pain all these things that you never knew you had like hamstrings when you lie there so long they shorten down of course when they start again they've got to pull them like elastic to their proper length and of course you have muscle charts they chart every muscle in your body. That means they have, sit there with a chart and they've got every muscle listed down. And then they go through the motions of asking you to move these various muscles. Whether you can move them or not, they can tell with their fingers on your limbs whether there's any reaction. And if there is a reaction, they can tell what strength it is and they put it down on a chart. Because most of mine were noughts, and then the next month they were noughts, and they just get tired of saying nought. They used to say zero, nothing, nought, nought, zero, nothing, you know, just to make a change. That's done in front of you. Whether they think of you as a human being while they're doing it, I don't know. I mean, perhaps they, they don't really know. They're not really concerned about you. They are, and they aren't, you know what I mean? I don't think they're thinking to themselves, oh, this might depress her, don't let's let her listen. They're just carrying on all round your body. They're all gathered round you. And you have to get over that embarrassment of lying stark naked while they all peer down at you very disinterestedly. And, of course, one's sitting there giving you a smile now and again. And you manage to give a smile back if you can make it. <laughs> With faith as red as a beetroot. Because, <clears throat> you see, it's such a lengthy business. It's not like there's a quick flash of you in the nude. It's a rather lengthy process, you know. Somebody's probably got an elbow on your stomach one end while they're looking at your feet and saying, now waggle your big toe, because you're going blue in the face trying to move your big toe, and you're sure it must be moving with the effort, and you look down at the toe. It's best not to look, really, because if you're not looking, you're sure that your big toe's moving, but if you open your eye, you see the ruddy thing still stuck up in the air. It's not even moved an inch. That depresses you immediately. Of course, they're all very cheerful. You know, they say, oh, never mind, keep trying. You see, you can see it's not moving. You feel that with such concentration and willing everything, you know, you're saying, move, move, move. And you think that it must move. Well, first of all... Appreciate the situation. Paralyzed. My left arm, completely... Make the physical drawbacks become of lesser importance. A very weak half arm. Accept it and forget it. You know I'm trying to. You can eventually. Difficult. You can't. Hate it. Learn and. Learn to be able. Being able to. Try. Being able to. Get on with it. Do it. Though my body. Defeated. Still I'm alive and heart and brain Search for roads across the wasteland To the living world again The exuberance of being able to do it It's tremendously exciting At first the simplest task defeats you and your heart breaks every day Till your stricken hands remember And you will them to obey Then I began to realize that 
perhaps life wasn't so bad after all. For the rest of my life, my body will lie here. Numbed and helpless, still I'm a man And a restless mind still drives me So I do the best I can It seemed incredible that, that I could do it It was like rediscovering something My dear friends, I'm writing this letter Though my hands lie dead and still But a man is more than a pair of hands When the mind joins with the will Even though we're down, we're not out The body may it's adaptation And it learns to improvise But the spirit can't surrender It must conquer or it dies And I had lots of pulleys put above my bed I was told that I was to hang on to and help myself. This was new fangled for me. I used to be chomping all round that bed and all these darn things used to ding, ding, ding all the way down the bed. It was like a tram with all little hangers and pulleys and rattled. And they used to call me budgie because <laughs> I was like a budgie in the cage. And I was always hooking from one to the other, like monkeys. And everybody had them. And it was rather funny. Anybody came in the ward, we all hung on these things like a load of monkeys in the zoo, all peering forwards. Because all the other people, they took me down to the occupational therapy department very bright and jolly. Where they train you, you know, to work away with one hand. And I heard the word polio, but I didn't exactly connect it with myself, you know what I mean? I got the shock of my life when I went down there. I think that it's just a word you read in the papers. And Suddenly, you don't really think when you're saying it. It struck me that I was a disabled person, that I was one of these people. That's that awful thing those people in Kent got, you know, isn't it a shame? What recovery you don't get within six months, you can say you've had it. If you've got a flicker, well then you can say in a year, that flicker will be stronger, more or less. I think some are more adaptable than others. I mean, I know a lot of people like myself and keep in touch with them. But I know very, very few that have given up. Very few, most of them, can do something. After six months, I got the use of my left leg back, for which I'm very grateful. It allows me to type. I can even draw with my left foot. When the old way will not serve you, then a new way must be found. Personally, I'm pretty vain, and I was put into a jacket when I came out of the lung. And it isn't a pretty thing, it's a big... Look, you look rather like a spaceman. And I was in that jacket for a year, and I did my damnedest to get out of it, because it was ugly. Legs and arms didn't matter. First of all, was breathing. And that was the day the doctor came to me to explain the principles of frog breathing which is um, taking mouthfuls of air and pushing the air into your lungs with your tongue. And you have to conquer the feeling that in fact you're not breathing because you're not conscious of air going down your nose. It's the sensation of holding your breath because you have to hold each gulp as it goes into your lungs till the next one goes down. Then when you've got sufficient, you let it all out at once. What is gone 
is gone forever What is left can learn again I think to be lying flat is very bad for morale. And when people come and look at you as if you're a cabbage, blurs you even further. And if you suddenly sit up a bit, and here you are, independent, typing for yourself, saying what you want, nobody else's assistance, it gave me satisfaction, pleasure, pride, self-respect. having the usual nice time, taking it on the swings and going on the beach, seeing familiar places. Every day and week that passes sees you growing stronger. Just a little more patience for you won't be here much longer. Life, this hope, the earth still goes on turning. Now it's time for you to teach the lesson you've been learning. Day still comes, the night still falls, and you must learn to live then. There are those who love you. And who need what you can give them? I just was beginning to forget what her voice sounded like and her face, you know. When she did come in, she seemed such a titchy little thing. And she said, hello, mummy. And she was very good. She wanted to sit up on the bed and she was interested more in the hangings on the bed and said, could she sit on my lap? Would it hurt my legs? Because I could hardly speak, actually. And she lisped, and I'd always denied that she'd lisped. I always said to everybody, she does not lisp. And I said, but she does lisp. I said, she doesn't. And every other word with a lisp. And I thought they were right. I hadn't heard it for so long. I seen them come and I seen them go. And often I used to wonder when my turn would ever come. Would I ever get home? And I was in there for a year. While there's life, there's hope to work and watch and pray. Drive each tortured nerve and muscle until it will obey. Wasted limbs must learn to work each day a little longer. Bear the pain and try again You won't be here much longer I just was so terrified they were going to send me home. I didn't really want to believe it. So I said, at least let me try. I began to hope a little when they, they started to make me a spinal jacket. If I, if I go home and I've never tried, I'll always have the thought in my mind that I could have walked if only you'd have given me the chance. The doctor came in and he said, I think with a jacket on, she'd be able to walk about. Well, I was able to do a sort of a shuffle, you know, these leg irons, because I wasn't using my legs in them. I was really elevating my body on my arms. But when they did come with this jacket and the dentist's headrest for my head to keep me rigid, and to hold it because it would have just fallen. I thought, no, but I can't face the world like this, can I? But you see, to do a three minute walk took me two hours. And then I, again, I said, well, there's others have done it. Why can't I? Unfortunately, I am still on a respirator and even that doesn't stop me going out. 
because I take one with me. A smaller version, but it does the same job. The first day they took me out, I felt it was wonderful. We went into the country, and the fields were green, and there was lots of space and trees in the sky. And it's, they're only little things, but things I didn't realize quite how much I'd missed them until I saw them again. It's goodbye now, I'm leaving you this morning And a thousand thanks for all the help you gave me For the strength of will, kindness and the patient skill And all the things that helped to save me From now on I'll learn to bide in the world outside So another phase of life is starting Home again with the ones you loved this morning An end to the lonely months of hoping Back to work and strife and the cares of normal life Now you'll have to show your skill at coping But when I did all on my own come out of hospital Very frightening at first It felt Ward with about 30 people For a year Felt very lonely Like coming out of prison The outside world was very strange to me The first night Just a dead silence, you know I think the homecoming is the frightening part of it because it's then you realise that you aren't capable of doing a lot. And of course at this time when I came home my daughter was in Scotland with my sister and I was worried. I wanted my little girl. Should I bring her home and try or leave her with my sister who was capable of doing everything for her and I decided to bring her home with me and then gradually I found that I was able for to do for her because he had a ring full on his own tongue tongue here comes the nurse with the red poultice slaps it on and takes no notice out there's the vacant that's two hot no, it's not. How can I do all the small things that have to be done every day? You'll have to learn how to do them in some other way. All of the things I once did in the house through the use of my hands. You'll have to learn how to manage the best that you can. All these things I wanted to do myself. I didn't want anybody to help me. 
help. I used to hate it. Even my husband used to come to help me. And it was times when I didn't want him to do so. And of course I had to learn to be able to dress myself with half an arm. I had to find new ways. They didn't come quick enough for me. But of course as time went on, putting my vest on myself. But once I'd achieved that, I was like a baby with a new toy. You know, I can do it myself now. <laughs> I don't need anybody to help me. I was once a person who'd rushed about, and I can't bear being slow, you know, because I would go tearing towards the kitchen. Very good for a wheelchair. <laughs> and of course, once I got clever at it, I quite enjoyed nipping through <laughs> with not an inch to spare, you know. Especially when the bacon's burning or the kettle's boiling or something terrible's happening in the kitchen. I can't get it quick enough. You're playing your part, you're managing, making do. Though you find it a struggle to see it through. You try and you fumble, you sigh and you grumble But it's better than being dependent on somebody else The more you endeavor, the more you will find you can do That you still can be useful to somebody else. Night, Mum. Come say good night then. Good kiss. Night, darling. God bless. Night. Go to bed now. It's like going into a doll's house, a little house where her family live. They seem to live in miniature. And I was sitting there. I went for the day. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see the kitchen. And I, I could see the saucepan bubbling on the stove, the lid jumping up and down, and the steam coming out. And this was just home. This, to me, was all the things, in a way, that I'd lost. And although it filled me with tremendous happiness to be there and to see it, it just filled me up. I went home about three years ago and my wife was paid to keep myself, two children and herself, eight pounds a week. But it didn't work out, so I had to return to hospital. And here I'm doomed to spend my days. I lost my health, my home, my son, my husband in the first year. And I looked round and I thought, well, I have nothing else. This is the end. I have nothing else to lose. It was only when I'd lost all that that I realised what I'd gained. I'd gained friends, help. I knew the truth. I suppose it's peace of mind that everybody's searching for. I think probably I've learnt more in the five years I've been in here than I would have learnt in 50 outside. According to the sort of people we were before, then I think we react in the same way afterwards. Life is funny because you have to pay in, as it were, before you receive. I think that, that one of our basic functions, say, severely disabled people, our basic duties is to try and live as normal a life as possible and to appear as normal as possible. Oh, I can tell you a whole lot about that. I have um, a lot of plans in my head. I've tried to put some of them 
into force, but it doesn't work very well. People aren't terribly interested because it costs a lot of money. What I would like to have done, I feel that a lot of us are young. We're healthy. We have the, the world and the life ahead of us. I've got friends, polio friends in America. I'd love to go and visit them to see how they cope. Most of us are stuck in hospital because there's nowhere for us to go to. But I think if a scheme could be developed for traveling, travel in a group, take one relative, each helping the other. You see, they do these special schemes for students, for school children. Why not us? disabilities become secondary. Family's still there, it still can be a worry. But really, there's so many things to do, to look forward to. You see, we have a lot to learn from each other. People should try and look on us as people, fellow people. I don't think we're conscious or embarrassedly conscious of our disability. Not really. Never took threat kindly, being talked about in the third person or, you know, sort of does he drink tea sort of thing, you know. This, people think that because you're disabled that, that you either haven't got a mind of your own or that you can't express yourself. We like people because they're people. We like them to be people back to us. Understanding, but not pity. We don't want you people to say, ah, those poor people, because we don't want your sympathy. We want help in doing many things, but not pity. Hands lie still, but the brain's not resting. Legs lie still, but the brain's still working. Body chained, but the mind's still questing. On its way. The majority of disabled people like to be independent. I am one of them. I like to be independent too. We have a saying in this ward that we live dangerously, and by golly, you do. If someone's forgotten to put a shilling in a meter, bang goes your air supply. And then everybody, they hunt for another shilling. See, we can't afford to have a quarterly meter here. One world, one cause for lame. And hold to share together. Our need is indivisible to keep the spirit undefeated. That is the human way. The Body Blow was the work of Ewan McCall, Peggy Seeger and Charles Parker and told of the battle against polio fought by five people. The singers were Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger. The guitar was played by Brian Daly. Concertina and ocarina by Alf Edwards. Flute and harmonica by Alfie Kahn. Banjo and guitar by Peggy Seeger. Recordings from real life were made in the homes of Norma Smith Paul Bates and Jean Hagger, and for Heather Ruffle and Duchy Holland in Ward 11A, Rush Green Hospital, Romford, Essex. The program was prepared with the help of the Polio Research Fund, and the recorded production was by Charles Parker. The 
hidden foe, it lies in wait and chooses place and time. It strikes the woman in her bloom, the young man in his prime. It takes the runner in full stride, the soldier in the field. The strong, the young, the healthy, to this enemy must yield.